Now look at the notes for extract one. You hear a consultant talking to a patient, Miss Wells, who has been referred by her GP due to a history of endometriosis. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look through the notes. Oh, hello, Miss Wells. Please come in and sit down. I'm Miss Moore, the consultant. I've read your GP's referral letter, which details your history of endometriosis. I wonder if I could start off by asking you a few questions. How old are you? Uh, I'm 22. Are you married? No, but I live with my partner. Have you ever been pregnant? No. And when was your last cervical smear? Um... Uh, that would have been done when I went to see my GP, mm -hmm. probably three months ago now. It was all normal. Okay, great. Now, I gather you've had some pelvic pain recently. Yes, that's right. Uh, it started in February of mm -hmm. this year, a sharp pain in the left side of my stomach. It usually came on a few days before my period and then seemed to settle down at the end of my period. Okay. After February, the pain got really bad, and it wouldn't go away. I was admitted to hospital. Oh, dear. Yeah, the consultant there performed a laparoscopy, and it revealed that on my left ovary and behind my room, I had endometriosis. After that, he suggested I should take the pill without a break. But the pain didn't get any better, so he started me on progesterone tablets, mm -hmm. which made me feel horrible. Mm -hmm. I put on weight and felt bloated all the time. I also developed acne. I hadn't had that since I was a teenager, but the pain still didn't get any better. So the consultant readmitted me in May of this year and performed another laparoscopy and treated the endometriosis with a diatomy. After that, I was much better and the pain almost completely went away. That was until August when it returned. Uh, it's been slowly getting worse since then, and again, as in the beginning, it's in my stomach and it hurts just before my periods. Only now the pain is there at all different times, and it really hurts when I'm having intercourse, especially in certain positions. Right, I see. And are your periods regular? Yes, regular because I'm taking the pill again with a week's break. The last one was about three weeks ago. What about any other health concerns? No, everything else is fine. I've never been a smoker, but I do like a drink at weekends. Just one or two, though, nothing crazy. My family are all well, too. No serious illness in either my mum or dad, or in my older sister. Nothing else I can think of, really. And do you have any problems passing urine or with your bowel motions? No, that's all good, too. All right, Miss Wells. I think it would be sensible to have a look at you and run some tests. Then we can chat about how to take things forward. But from what you've told me, my initial suspicions are that the endometriosis might have come back. That's what I was afraid of. Since I was first diagnosed, I've been doing a lot of reading, so I was really worried when the pain returned. I'd like to be able to have children in the future, and I'm worried it might be difficult with the endometriosis. I really don't want to be one of those women who ends up having problems getting pregnant. I'm also really sick and tired of the pain. It's beginning to feel like I'll be stuck with it forever. I can tell it's starting to affect my mood. Just ask my boyfriend. Extract 2. 
questions 13 to 24. In this part of the test, you will hear Nurse Melissa Sweet interviewing Mr Jim Fisher, an elderly patient. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Firstly, let's look at the immediate needs you'll have when you go home. Now, at this hospital, we are a very good relationship with an organisation called Blue Care. Have you heard of Blue Care? No. Well, Blue Care is a church-based organisation which offers a variety of community services and they aim at maximising the individual's independence and quality of life. Their staff includes nurses who can help you with some of your personal care, like showering and shaving. Mm. They'll come every second day to check on your wound. Mm -hmm. What they will do is dress your wound, apply ointment, and help you with other medications. But, but what about the cost? Because I'm on pension, you know. The good news is that these services are subsidised by the government, so there's no charge. And no one is excluded from receiving a service because of financial hardship. They also provide a range of other services, including social support, such as a chaplain for spiritual support, who can visit you if you would like that. And they also have volunteers who can call in for a chat if you want some company. Yeah, well, I can see that that would be a help. Now let me ask you how you see your future. Do you want to continue to manage in your own home, or would you prefer to move to an aged care facility? Oh, no, 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 I want to stay in my own home. I'm just worried because I'm still recovering from this wound and I don't know how I'll, I'll manage to cook. Let's just take this one step at a time. I can also arrange for an organisation called Meals on Wheels to bring in your meals. Mm, well, well, that sounds okay, but, but how does that work? Well, they generally come in daily, five days a week. They provide one main meal per day, which is healthy and nutritious. What about Saturday and, and Sunday? Well, on Fridays, they provide extra meals for the weekend, which you can keep in the fridge. Now, for the longer term, we'll arrange for the aged care assessment team to make an appointment for a visit for you. Have you heard of this service? No, no, I haven't. The government has provided this service because they want to help and encourage you to continue to live in your own home as long as you are capable of managing. Mm, I see. The team, which might include a doctor, nurse, social worker or other health professionals, come to your home and assess what your needs are and how you're managing. They assess your ability to manage on your own at home. Well, as I said before, I'd like to stay at home. I've still got all my faculties, but I don't think my, my balance is all that good. So what would happen if I had a fall and, and, and no one was there? Well, Mr Fisher, do you have a safety rail in your shower? No, I don't. Well, you see, they can arrange for safety modifications like support rails in the bathroom and toilet or safety ramps where they're needed. Well, that's good because, you know, it's a two-storey house and, and I worry that I, I could have a fall on the steps. Mm. Well, adequate, adequate support rails would be a consideration to make you feel safer. They can also organise a medical alert bracelet. Uh, how, how does that work? Well, this can be worn on your wrist. In an emergency, you press the button and a message is sent to the ambulance service who will respond quickly. Yeah, well, uh, I didn't really know there was all that help out there. Now, I'll give you this set of brochures which tells you all about the services offered by Blue Care, Meals on Wheels and the Aged Care Assessment Team. And when you've had time to look through them, I'll call back to see if you have any more questions. Uh, nurse, there's just... One more thing that I'd, I'd like to talk to you about. What's that, Mr Fisher? Oh, as I said before, my old neighbours have moved away and, and our neighbourhood's changed a lot. So I do feel a bit alone, you know, and, and over the past year there's been several house break-ins in the neighbourhood. 
Well, there is one other thing I could suggest. Oh, what's that? It's another government initiative called Home Assist Secure. And if you're over 60, which of course you are, you can receive advice and help relating to home safety issues. Oh, what can they do? The Home Assist field staff have been trained and cleared by the police to come to your home and offer you free information and assistance. What, what kind of assistance? Well, they can help you with security lighting outside your home. Mm. Um, they can also install windows and door locks and security screens. Oh, well, that sounds like a good service. And smoke alarms are another safety device that they can install in case of a fire. Well, that's important. That is the end for Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the question 25. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about different types of breath sounds. Now read the question. Hello, Doctor. Can you explain what are the different types of breath sounds? Well, there are several distinct types of abnormal breath sounds. Crackles, also called rails, tend to sound like discontinuous clicking. Bubbling or rattling when the person inhales. Uh, crackling breath sounds may sound dry or wet, and physicians might describe them as either coarse or fine. Stridor is a high-pitched, harsh, wheeze-like sound that occurs while breathing in people with a blocked upper airway. Wheezing noises are high-pitched and persistent that may sound like a breathy whistle. At times, wheezing can be loud enough to hear even without a stethoscope. A short version of a wheeze, called a squawk, occurs during inhalation. Ronky are persistent, lower-pitched, rough sounds similar to snoring. Question 26. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about Heberdeen's nodes. Now read the question. The bony growths that develop on the finger joints are called Heberdeen's nodes, or interphalangeal joints. Mostly, Heberdeen's nodes develop on the joints nearest to the fingertips, causing the fingers to appear crooked. They only develop in osteoarthritis patients. Each joint in our body has a layer of cartilage to protect the bones. Osteoarthritis causes the cartilage layer to degrade, gradually allowing the bones and the joints contact directly with each other. Over time, the bones get damaged from scraping together. Our body reacts to this body damage by developing new bones that are known as nodes. Heberdeen's nodes are one of such bone formations on the fingers of patients with severe osteoarthritis. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about surgical treatments for patients with a desiccated disc. Now read the question.
Hello, doctor. What are the surgical treatments for patients with a desiccated disc? There are many different surgical treatments for a desiccated disc. In the method called fusion, the vertebrae surrounding the desiccated disc will be joined together to stabilize the back and prevent movement that will worsen pain causing discomfort. In the decompression method, the extra bone or a disc material that has moved out of place is removed to make more room for the spinal nerves. In the correction method, the surgeon will make the necessary repairs to correct an abnormal curvature of the spine to relieve pain and increase range of motion. In the implant method, artificial discs, or spacers, will be placed in between vertebrae to prevent the bones from rubbing. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about outcomes of TB skin test. Now read the question. Doctor, can you explain to me the outcomes of a TB skin test? Well, the outcomes for TB skin tests are not always clear-cut. The main consideration in a TB test is the size of the bump on the arm. If the bump is smaller than 5 millimeters, then the test result is considered negative to TB. In a case where the test bump is larger than 5 millimeters, then the test result is considered positive. But we have to be very cautious about false positive and false negative. At times, patients vaccinated against TB using the Bacillus calmet garin can show a false positive result for TB. There is also a possibility that when the patient's infected with bacteria similar to TB, false negative result happens when a person has a weak immune system or has been exposed to pathogens, such as smallpox or measles. Patients infected with TB very recently and very old TB patients can also show false negative test results. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about atelectasis. Now read the question. A partial or complete collapse of one or both the lungs is called atelectasis. That occurs when tiny air sacs in the lungs, called alveoli, deflate. The collapse of the lowest lobes in both the lungs is called bibasilar atelectasis. The lobes of the lungs are filled with millions of tiny sacs, called alveoli, which are arranged in clusters and surrounded by blood vessels. When a person breathes, the alveoli allow their blood to collect oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. During bibasilar atelectasis, the alveoli in the lower lobes of the lungs deflate and stop performing this crucial task, therefore blocking oxygen from reaching the vital organs, life-threatening at times. Question 30. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about liver flukes. Now read the question. Doctor, what are liver flukes? Liver flukes is a parasite disease. A patient may never know he has liver flukes. Even the doctors at times may not diagnose the condition because the symptoms of fasciolysis are similar to many other conditions. There are chances that a person with liver flukes living may never develop fasciolysis. Others may develop fasciolysis many years after the liver flukes entered the body. A person cannot transmit liver flukes accidentally to someone else unlike other parasite diseases. Liver flukes make their way from the intestines to the liver once it enters the body. To get into the liver, the liver flukes must burrow through the lining of the liver causing pain in the upper right abdomen. The two types of liver flukes that can affect people are fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica.
That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on the topic blood type classifications. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. The human body contains about 10 pints of blood depending on the size of the individual. However, the blood composition is not the same in each individual. This is what makes the different blood types. The best method of grouping of blood is the ABO system, although there are other groups. Within the ABO group, there are four major categories that are divided into eight common blood types. A, B, O, and AB. Blood consists of cells and a yellow liquid known as plasma. The group of blood depends on what each part of the blood contains. There are two main blood group systems, ABO antigens and rhesus antigens. These two antigens are used to classify blood types. Normally, viruses and bacteria carry an antigen. During an infection, the antigen marks them as a foreign substance to the body that are usually not found in the body. Most red blood cell antigens are protein molecules on the surface of red blood cells. White blood cells produce antibodies as an immune defense. These antibodies target antigens and attack the foreign substance. Cross-matching of blood types is very crucial because if a patient receives red blood cells with antigens that is not present in his body, then it will reject and attack the new red blood cells. The ABO blood grouping method is used to determine the different types of antigens in the red blood cells and antibodies in the plasma. This system and RHD antigen status determine the blood type that will match for a safe red blood cell transfusion. There are four ABO groups. In group A, the surface of the red blood cells contains A antigen and the plasma has anti-B antibody that would attack any foreign B antigen containing red blood cells. In group B, the surface of the red blood cells contains B antigen and the plasma has anti-A antibody that would attack any foreign A antigen containing red blood cells. In group AB, the red blood cells have both A and B antigens, but the plasma does not contain anti-A or anti-B antibodies. Patients with type AB can receive any ABO blood type. In group O, the plasma contains both types of anti-A and anti-B antibodies, but the surface of the red blood cells does not contain any A or B antigens. 
Having none of these A or B antigens means that they can be safely transfused to a person with any ABO blood type. Some red blood cells contain the Rh factor, which is also called Rhd antigen. Therefore, rhesus grouping adds another dimension. In case the red blood cells contain the Rhd antigen, they are Rhd positive. If they do not contain Rhd antigen, they are Rhd negative. That means there are eight major blood types in the ABO slash Rhd blood grouping system. For instance, in the US, 30% population are A positive, A plus. A negative occurs in 6% of people. There are only 9% of population with B positive, while B negative occurs in just 2% of the population. AB positive occurs in 4% of people, and AB negative occurs in just 1% of people. O positive occurs in 39% of people, while O negative occurs in just 9% of people. About 82% of the U.S. population has RHD positive blood. O negative blood contains neither A or B or RHD antigens. Therefore, these red blood cells can be transfused to nearly all patients of any blood type. Group O negative is considered as the universal donor type. On the other hand, AB positive blood contains no anti-A or anti-B or RHD antibodies. Therefore, patients with this blood type can receive nearly any type of red blood cell transfusion. This type is referred to as the universal recipient type. In case a patient with group B antigen receives red blood cells from a person with group A antigen, their body will reject the transfusion. This is because patients with B antigen on their red blood cells have anti-A antibody in their plasma. The anti-A antibody in the plasma then attacks and destroys the A antigen donor red blood cells. During pregnancy, a mother may have a different RHD type to the fetus, as the fetus can inherit a different blood group from the genes of the father. Therefore, a risk is involved if the mother is RHD negative and the fetus is RHD positive. A small amount of red blood cells from the fetus can enter the mother's bloodstream, resulting in creation of anti-RHD antibody in the plasma by the mother, which is known as sensitization. A problem will arise if this antibody then detects the foreign antigen in the blood cells of the fetus, and if they attack the red blood cells of the fetus as a defense mechanism, which can result in severe jaundice and brain damage if undetected. Therefore, an injection of anti-D immunoglobin G helps to prevent the production of this antibody in the mother and decrease the impact of a sensitizing event on the fetus. Anti-D immunoglobin G dosing is usually given at 24 weeks of the pregnancy and at times an additional dose during 34 weeks of pregnancy. The effect of anti-D immunoglobin G lasts up to 12 weeks. During blood test procedure, the patient's blood will be mixed with a variety of serum samples. Each serum sample consists of a different blood type, with the clotting agent removed. Then, the reaction of the blood sample of the patient with the serum sample will be monitored. The antibodies in the serum will cause a different reaction in each one. For instance, if a reaction occurs when the blood sample is mixed with the serum consisting of blood type A, which contains anti-B antibody, the unknown blood type of the patient must be type B. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear a dermatologist called Dr. Jake Cooper talking about a skin condition called hydrodonitis suppurativa, HS. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Hello, my name's Jake Cooper. I'm a dermatologist, and I'm going to talk about a skin condition called hydrodenitis suppurativa, commonly abbreviated to HS. Let me tell you a bit about this condition. HS is a chronic inflammatory disorder characterized by painful swollen lumps on the skin, which may break open, releasing fluid or pus. It's also called acne inversa, and in fact, sufferers often think they've got acne or pimples. But unlike acne, HS affects apocrine gland-bearing sites, in particular the armpits and the pubic regions. It's not a very well-known disease in the medical community, which is surprising, as it affects about 1% of the population, and early occurrences are commonly misdiagnosed as simple nodules or abscesses. This is unfortunate, as the condition can be very distressing for the patient. We don't know exactly what causes HS, though it seems to be linked to blocking of the hair follicles in the affected area. It tends to occur most often in younger females, and it's often found in patients who are overweight. Studies carried out into a possible link between deodorant use and HS have so far been inconclusive, but the condition is more prevalent among smokers, and there's some evidence that nicotine may affect the follicles. Patients sometimes worry that they've caused the condition by shaving, or possibly by using depilatory creams, but there's no evidence that either is a contributing factor. Let me tell you about one case I encountered recently. This was a 22-year-old woman called Sophie, who came to see me because she had a number of painful boils in her groin. These had been occurring with fluctuating severity for the previous three years. When I questioned her further, I learned that she'd previously undergone incision and drainage of various lesions on multiple occasions at various medical centres. She also told me that she'd taken a course of an unknown oral antibiotic to treat an abscess about two months earlier. So I was able to put two and two together and make a connection with HS. Then we could start to think about the right sort of long-term treatment for her. When treating patients with HS, it's important to be aware of the impact it can have on them. Many studies have confirmed that patients with HS commonly experience depression as a result of their condition. Additionally, HS has a significant psychosocial impact. Patients reported feeling unworthy and unlovable, and described their lesions as ugly, smelly, and embarrassing. In some cases, symptoms may spontaneously resolve themselves for long periods of time. But both doctor and patient need to remember that there could be a flare-up years or even decades later, and that currently, treatment is limited to finding a way to manage the condition. HS may present itself in younger patients too. In another case, I saw a 14-year-old girl called Emily who came to see me with her mother following a diagnosis of HS by her GP. We needed to confirm the diagnosis and decide on the most appropriate treatment. Her mother expressed concerns about what she referred to as Emily's unappealing hygiene. <laughs> this was said in front of the girl. Now, we know that HS is notably not due to poor hygiene. While HS is a skin disease, it's happening lower in the dermis than just the surface level. In this case, Emily had a lesion on the mons pubis, which required surgical intervention. Following incision and drainage, her condition improved, but this does illustrate the need to consider not just the patient, but also the attitude of family members. In general, when it comes to treatment, once we make a diagnosis, there are multiple therapies indicated, depending on the severity of the disease and patient presentation. One thing patients often ask me is whether they need to make changes to their diet. One small-scale study followed 12 HS sufferers who cut out beer from their diet, together with other foods containing yeast, such as bread and some types of cake and this did appear to have an effect on their symptoms. It's also known that overproduction of one group of hormones called androgens may contribute to the symptoms of HS. These hormones are linked to insulin, and foods such as milk and cheese can raise insulin levels. So reducing these types of foods might be helpful. However, 
A controlled diet, which leads to weight loss, is certainly recommended for patients who are overweight or obese. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.